Good day, rock stars. How are you out there today? I have to say, I'm getting really, uh, starting to get more and more content with my, my mustache curls over here. Really, uh, I really glopped that mustache wax in today, that honest Amish. See if more of it caused a better hold. So if you see any do or doobins down there, maybe a little mustache wax to try to comb it all out. I got a, I got a series of combs I use. There's one of them keeping the car. Got a little carabiner. I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a product review video on my mustache combs soon. Just like I had a product review of three mustache waxes. I'm gonna do a product review of three mustache combs. It's gonna be hard to choose my favorite of the three mustache combs. I really like all of them. They're very, they're very nice combs. Um, yeah, as the weather gets a little cooler, um, mustache wax will hold better. Maybe I don't want to use so much of it. Also, as my hairs all grow out more and continuously wax them and train them, they, they learn to stay down. They learn to, they learn to fall in line. Mustache hairs are like soldiers. Got to fall in line with the others. They're also like flowers in the garden. And maybe uh, in a way, soldiers are also like flowers in the garden. Why not? Why not? It is cooler today. Looks like we might have some thunderstorms. It's cloudy, so we won't have the same glare on this video, hopefully, that we had yesterday. There's some, sun, there's some sunshine poking through, but uh, I could use a rainy day. I'm in a rainy day mood. I like rainy days. I don't know, I always feel most alive on rainy days. Water is life-giving, rain is life-giving. Some people don't like rainy days. I do. So, um... So I want to talk about money. We all know money, our old friend money. We all need it to survive in this, uh, in this um, world these days that humans have created. It's a game. You gotta learn to play the game of money. Oh. You have some glare coming in. Damn you, son, go away. It's all right. We'll make it work for us. So, um, I've not had very much money most of my life. I lived uh, hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck. 41 now and uh, I haven't saved up much I'm sort of I'm sort of behind where I want to be um I was too busy having fun I'll take a sip of my kombucha today we got something called controlled burn it's got ginger cayenne and turmeric 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 Not bad, not bad, I like the burn. I like the burn. So, yeah, I was busy having fun. I was, uh, most of my 20s and in my 30s, I was running around going to music festivals. I was uh, abusing drugs. I don't recommend you abuse drugs, you can roll around in music festivals and have fun without them. I promise. I smoke a little weed, been hurt much. But uh, I used to love, I used to go to All Good Festival up in Marvin's Mountaintop in West Virginia, and it was a uh, multiple 
day camp out festival and uh, I saw some fantastic musical acts and uh, I've had some of the most fun of my entire life. I've had, I've had some of the most fun that almost anybody can have. Sometimes I think I've had enough fun for, you know, over 10 lifetimes. I've, I've had a lot of fun in my earlier, younger years. Um, I didn't save a lot of money. And that's not entirely bad. Uh, you, you shouldn't worship money. You gotta have fun while you're young and have the and can have fun, you know? There's a balance. I leaned a little bit too hard on the fun. Um, you need to always prepare for the future too. So I'm making up for lost time now. And um, I am trying to, uh, I don't go to music festivals or concerts that much anymore. My, my wife has never really uh, been into that kind of thing. Um, not that she's been to a lot. I. But uh, it's, it's, it's easier to sort of change your lifestyle when you have somebody else who lives a different lifestyle that, you, that you're, that you're uh, as a partner. Someone else as a partner who lives a different lifestyle. And um, it's interesting how like what I used to think was expensive I sort of disregard now. I don't really think about um, things so much when I buy them. I've, uh, once I married my wife, things sort of took off for us financially. Um, first of all, being partnered with somebody, you save a lot of money. You, when you when you have somebody who you can effectively work with well as a team, you somehow end up saving all sorts of money between the two of them, two of you. You know, you figure out ways. You don't. There's things you realize you don't need. It just it just works. You know, it's important to have a good partner in life. Not just someone who loves you, but someone who's a good teammate, someone who's responsible. Someone who knows how to take care of themselves. Someone who knows how to take care of you. And someone that needs you to take care of them in ways as well. Um, I think me and my wife share a very good dynamic. I, I feel very blessed to have met her and to have been married to her for um, know, five years now. I met my wife, she didn't have a whole lot of money, but uh, she never really, she wasn't earning a whole lot of money, I should say, but she never really went out and spent a lot. So she had a, she had saved up a lot. Or all I did was spend money. I would go to the bars quite frequently and music festivals and living the bachelor lifestyle. You know, you gotta spend money in order to meet people. That's, you know, that's the kind of life that it's, it's hard. It's hard to, like, go on dates when you're poor, you know? And a couple girlfriends I had always seemed to bounce when the money ran out. Or maybe I was just being a miserable asshole. Or maybe they weren't the one. Maybe that's why. They were not, they were not good life partners. They had a lot of great qualities, but uh, they weren't my right match. You gotta find who's right for you. Just because they're a good person and you love them doesn't mean they're right for your life. Doesn't mean they're helping your life. So yeah, it's about money and love today, I guess. Now that we've been married, uh, soon after we got married, we, we we invested in a restaurant, and a 
it was one of the best investments I've ever made in my life. Um, if you know what, if you, if you have a successful restaurant, it is just a money printing machine. And we uh, we are part owners of a Thai restaurant. It's most my wife's from Thailand, so it's me and her and <clears throat> her brother and a couple other uh, friends of her family. And we are like twenty five percent owners. About um, we now have two restaurants that we were invested in and there's more on the horizon. Um, we are one of the most popular Thai restaurants in the area. And people, and it's very authentic. It's uh, my wife, family, who's, who's cooking all the food, making their authentic Thai uh, meals and presentations. Now, when you're opening a restaurant, there are a lot of people coming and, and start throwing a lot of negative statistics at you. They <clears throat> will be like, oh, do you know the number of uh, new restaurants that fail within the first year or two? And you got to make sure you have this and this and this. And these aren't people that ever owned restaurants. These are just people that are worried for your well-being. But, uh, you know, sometimes people worrying for your well-being doesn't really help your situation, your dreams. You can't listen to other people. Sometimes you have to trust your gut. And, uh, you know... Yeah, there's, I guess those statistics are true. A lot of restaurants do fail uh, almost immediately. But, I, you know, I see a lot of restaurants opening up in places that just have no business being there or, or just stupid concepts. Like, you know, you have to... First of all, if you want to open a restaurant in an area, you have to know that area. You just can't roll in as an outsider and be like, I'm going to open this here. Uh, it, it, if you can maybe get lucky, but you really should spend some time living in that area for a while, know what it needs, what it lacks. And, uh, you know, if you are bringing something to the table that is not there, there's, you know, you have a, a very, very high chance of success, especially if it's good. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're patient and you find the right situation, you know, we found a place that the rent was relatively cheap that already had a kitchen mostly built out. So the, our, our beginning operational costs were very low. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you have to find, uh, you have to find the right place. Also the kind of place I chose spoke to me spiritually, but that's a whole separate matter. Um, there's spiritual ways to channel money and success, but I, I, I'm not familiar with those so much, but yeah, you see, I see a lot of dumb ideas like you know uh a spot i know of serves dessert waffles um it, it, that's it how sure the cost of making a waffle is really cheap but how many people are just rolling and buying dessert waffles i buy on belgian waffles on a stick covered in chocolate like uh, or you know hookah bars people really going in and hanging out at hookah bars. I guess there is a subculture, but a lot of these things that don't seem to make sense, that seem to do well and last for a while, I gotta imagine they're, they're a front for some other type of money laundering from some other nefarious business or activity. Um, that being said, you know, if you want to launder money, a, a restaurant or a food truck is a really great way to do that i'm only not that i suggest you do that youtube we're not suggesting anyone participate in any illegal activity by any means but it seems that you know if you want to a, a restaurant is a good cover as a way to explain 
where money is coming in and out of. Back when I was doing more music festivals, I always sort of wish I had done a food truck. That way I could just roll into music festivals. And while I'm there, just make a bunch of money. I don't have to pay to be there. Well, I have to pay to have a spot to be there, but you can make a lot of money doing festivals. We, we know uh, some Thai people that they strictly just do street festivals and they'll set up their, their uh, tent and they'll cook Thai food. So chicken on a stick and pork on a stick and, you know, fried rice and all sorts of things. It's easy for them to whip out and they'll make up to 10 grand after, you know, after being there for a couple of days. Maybe even in a day, sometimes. You can, and, and you know, they don't, they're not paying rent on a, on a location. They just have to, you know, pay rent on the spot for the weekend. They seem to have a really fun time doing it, rolling around different places, meeting people. That's, that's the way to do it, right there. Especially if you're starting out. Also, like, uh, marketplaces, like buildings that have a bunch of booths that are set up and, you know, everyone in the building can sort of share one liquor license and, uh, you kind of just set up there and you have a small little booth where you cook your food and if you make enough money, you can eventually, uh, raise and have your own spot. You also need someone on your team that is good at handling the money. It's not me. My track record has shown that I am better at letting other people deal with the savings of the money and all that stuff. I'm really good at the marketing and the digital and social media presence. That's sort of my sort of my game. <clears throat> but yeah, if you if you are, you know confident in your product and you know that the market in that particular area is hungry for that kind of product you're not going to fail you're going to be successful and as long as you're not you know a waste story who can't handle or manage your, your money or your life you will do well like uh, we actually bought someone out of our lease because they were having a brunch spot and they were in a neighborhood that was mostly a neighborhood that really got going in the evening time. Not a lot of people hung out there for breakfast or brunch. And they weren't even opening early enough to serve coffee. Everyone was at work by the time they were opening. It was a horrible, it was a horrible uh, business setup. Not that their food wasn't good, but you know, there's already brunch places and coffee places in the area. And if they're not going to open, up early enough to compete with it, then they're definitely not going to make money. They were stuck in a five-year lease, and they were about two years in, and we bought them out of their lease. Um, so, which is also why we we got our rent for generally pretty cheap, and there was already a built-out kitchen. They had done all the work for us. Thank you. So, we got the restaurants, and they're printing money, and we get nice quarterly payments plus my wife works at the restaurant and she creates her own salary and I have my own full-time job where I get paid so it's like between us we have our two salaries and the restaurant's a whole extra salary you know it's about you know, the profits of our quarter bringing about 40 grand a year it's not bad you prepare to put some of that away for taxes though So uh, once you start making money, it, it kind of compounds. Your uh, aspirations grow bigger. Uh, your investments get larger. And you need to keep making a, the same or a similar amount of, of money and earnings in order to maintain your uh, more advanced and beefed up lifestyle. Um, you know, people that have a lot of things don't necessarily have... Like, like people who have nice cars and bigger houses and all these and swimming pools and stuff, they don't necessarily have much more spending cash day to day than you know someone who's poor. Like I was just going to music festivals. And they just had larger investments. They were able to uh, buy bigger and nicer things. I didn't invest in much. My 401k is not where I want it to be. 
Some people say, don't bother in 401k. Some people say, oh my God, you need a 401k. Um, I find the restaurants, I find like I need to make more money in a short period of time. And uh, dumping my money into these, these restaurant ideas, the ones I think will work, to me is the best investment that I can make for short-term growth. And I am putting some money away in a 401k, um, but I'm keeping uh, a lot of income sort of ready for other investments. Another one of the great investments I made in life, which was sort of an accident, was the house that I purchased. I didn't even mean to purchase it. I was gonna rent uh, my house for my friend's dad who um, was gonna, it was like a two story, three bedroom row house in Baltimore, uh, one and a half bathrooms. He's gonna rent it to me for a thousand dollars a month and I had a roommate lined up and I had all my stuff in a storage locker and I was sleeping at a friend's house for six months. And then my friend's father, who's gonna rent me, the house is like, I cannot, rent you the house anymore. I, I am, you know, in the red on this business I have. The IRS is coming at me for money. I have to sell the house. And he's like, and I need you to get out of the house because I have to fix up a bunch of things with the house before I'm able to sell it. And I said, I just, you know, had this gut feeling like, all right, you know, why am I wasting my money paying rent? I said, don't fix it up. I'll buy it as is. And I, I think I bought that thing for like 130, 130, 140 thousand dollars at the time. And now it's, and I bought it back in 2014. Just, you know, kind of fell into my lap. And now that sucker's worth close to 300 thousand. I think when I'm ready to sell, we put some work into the kitchen and the bathroom. And I'm gonna, might do to re redo the floors before I sell it. Depends. Maybe I can sell it as is to somebody, but yeah, I'm gonna make well over $100,000 off that sucker when I'm ready to sell it. And I'm gonna move out of the city and buy a nice house, with a big yard, someplace a little bit more rural. And uh, take my time choosing that place because I plan to spend a large period of my time in that new residence, at least 10 years. Plus, I want a place that when I am actually ready to sell it for any reason, I am able to make money or at least have it hold its money. There's all this nice growth around the area. When I bought my house, it was the area was not very good, but I was a bachelor. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a kid or a wife, and I lived in Baltimore since 2000. And it wasn't that bad to me. It sucked these things up, no problem. And now it's super gentrified and they're doing all this work around, around my house and they're putting it in shopping. I think they're putting it in a Starbucks around the corner within the next year or two. That happens. Property value is gonna go up another 50 grand. I don't think I could sell for much more than 300,000, but that's good enough, good enough for me. So, you know, a large thing about making money too is about seizing Life gives you opportunities and you have to be aware enough to be able to seize these opportunities when life presents them to you. And if you seize these opportunities, you will find success and financial success comes with that. Um, buying my house was one of those opportunities. It was like, Hey, here it is. You can grab it or you can pass it by. But if I passed it by, who knows where I would be? Um, Marrying my wife was the other opportunity that presented itself that I could not pass by. Um, yeah, there's there, but you'll know when it's happening. It's your sort of a big decision you have to make. Take it, take the risk. You never, you never get ahead in life without taking risks. You, if you are keep saving doing the same safe day-to-day -day activity, working the same job. And another thing that, that uh, helped me advance was 
I was working a dead end job for 10 years. I was stuck in a rut. And I quit that job without any certainty of uh, what this new job I have was going to offer me as far as full time position. And um, even steady hours. And here I am, several years later, a uh, manager. Managing a couple different departments. Making make manager money. That's right. So, you gotta take risks. You gotta seize opportunities. It's scary. But, you know, growth is scary. Growth can be painful. You have to make sacrifices. You have to take risks. And I guarantee if you are unhappy with your situation, taking sacrifices and, and risks are, are will be worth it. You'll find yourself somewhere else doing something else and you will grow from that experience, undoubtedly. It'll be good for you. I was at a point with my last job where If I, I, I didn't even care anymore. I, I hated it so much that I, I was like, I'd rather be poor and try to scrape by than continue doing this. Anything's got to be better. When you feel that way, leave. That's the, the world that the spirit's telling you, hey, you're ready to move on. You're ready to graduate to bigger and better things. Also, I want to just uh, take a moment here towards the end of this video and talk about Elon Musk changing Twitter to X. I guess, I guess you won't be doing tweets anymore. Um, you'll be uh, signing your X. It's a little weird, but um, it made me think about this. When I was working at that dead end job, it was an architecture firm. It was, um, it was fun. I learned a lot. But I wasn't an architect and that wasn't my dream. I was born in graphics and art. But we were working a project for the CEO of Extreme Sports, spelled X dash T R E M E. And this was sort of the, uh, like a Canadian or European version of the X Games, basically. It was like the X Games in Europe. And. The CEO was like, we were having a conversation, like me and a couple of the other managers at the, or partners, and I was listening to the CEO talk, and he was saying that the letter X in your logo is good luck, and it brings in money, brings in brings in a lot of money and earnings. It's it's good financial. It's a good financial. Thing to have an X in your logo. And uh, he also said uh, there's also a lot of belief about using the color green in your logo. Um, tends to circulate more money to your business as well. If you notice in the Rockstar Podcast logo, there the hand is green. I did that on purpose because of that reason. Now, I don't know if there's a, you know, if it's good luck or spiritual or, or, or maybe, you know, the symbol X and the color green work psychologically on people where we are just subconsciously more drawn to it. X marks the spot on the map. That's where the treasure is. Green's the color of money. Green also has sort of uh, vibrational energies uh, when I talk about colors and vibrational energies, I believe there's a science behind that. It's not just spiritual. I feel like that root, though, is where, you know, the spiritual realm and science sort of meet. And I think there's a lot a lot of, of the talk about there where science and spirituality meet. Maybe we'll do a video on that. But um, I wonder if uh, Elon Musk is knows the same thing. Oh, so the color, yeah, also the guy who did extreme sports, he had green in his logo too. So he had the X, he had the color green. 
Elon Musk's X is not green. In fact, Twitter still sort of got, I think it's still going to be blue, but the X looks black. But I wonder if Elon Musk knows about the X and its uh, proclivity to circulate money towards it. And who knows? Maybe Twitter will go green. Get your green check mark moving forward. So, that's it. That's all I want to talk to you today. Today was all about money. I was going to go into like weird investments I made with cryptocurrency and stuff like that, but uh, you do a whole video talking about cryptocurrency. We'll wait until it's trending again. Because right now it's in a bear market, but I don't believe that's always going to be the case. So if you want to circulate money, take risks, find yourself a good partner in life, whether it's romantic or financial, your friendship, and uh, you know, try to let her X in the color green. See what that does for you. All right. All right, rock stars. I love you all. Rock and roll. Peace out.